Aloha mai kako. My name is Malia Kipapa and I work for Kamehameha Schools. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening to our lecture this evening, Puana Kaike. The lecturer for this evening is Lily Lyons Duruwa. She is the Director of Culture and Leisure Activities at the Sheraton Kona Resort and Spa at Kauhau Bay. Kauho Bay. Color my if it's incorrect. Her connection to Keoho has grown through the years under the care of Auntie Lily Haanio Kong and the preservation of Kaukulailai in Keoho. Born and raised in Kailua Kona, Lily is living her passion each day at the Sheraton Kona. Committed to ensuring the land and its stories will live on for generations. Lily says, Our kupuna have left us gifts on this aina. Our kuleana is to look to the past for their wisdom. What does it mean to us today? The learning can take us into the future, for ancient wisdom is timeless. Keoho has been the center of many new currents in our Hawaiian history. It is these currents that has intrigued Lily and continues to drive her passion for Keoho. Lily will share stories of Kaukulailai Keoho and the sites or makana that are still there today. Heiau Kanikani Kaula, the Kuula, and the Menehune tree, just to name a few. She will connect the currents of time and how Keoho is still a place of renewal. You, hear, you will hear of her journey inspired by Auntie Lili Ha'anio Kong and how the currents of Keoho have shaped and guided what she does today. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Lily Lyons Duruwa. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Mahalo for being here. My name is Lily Hanako Kahelelani Lyons Duduwa. I was born and raised here in Kailua Kona. My mother is Sally Kalala Alohikia Toko, and she comes from the island of Kauai. And her kupuna, her ancestors, come from Waipio Valley here on Hawaii Island. My father is Joseph Peter Lyons, and he comes from the Bronx in New York. <laughs> now you know why I look the way I look. Um, my mother was almost pure Hawaiian, my father pure English-Irish, so of course I'm hapa. <laughs> I am eight of eight children. There are seven girls and one boy in my ohana. And um, I include her now in my genealogy only because if it wasn't for her, I would not be standing here in front of you this evening. And that's my new kupuna, Auntie Lili Ha'anio Kong, who has bestowed all of the information that I have to share with you this evening, and I'm so honored. Um, so I, with my introduction, I have put some pictures up here that I personally took with my camera. And I'm sharing them as part of my introduction to give you a glimpse of what I truly appreciate here in Hawaii Island. And every time that I see these elements or these parts of our island, I say to myself, my gosh, I'm the luckiest person in the world. So at the very top is Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. These are really have just recently been taken. I have the privilege of being in Waimea a few times a, a month at this early hour. So I took that with my iPhone, no trick photography, just like that. Isn't that beautiful? And it was probably about 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, the sun sets off of Keoho Bay right here. That's right in front of the hotel. Of course, you recognize the other two shots of the bay. Um, that was actually not too long ago as well. One of them was actually Christmas morning. And those are just days, although I see the bay every day, I still stop and take a deep breath and go, wow. I am so lucky. And then the moonlight also was right off of our restaurant here one evening. Um, that It was so clear, and it was just rising above Hualalai. Um, and then last but not least is Waipio Valley, which is where my ohana comes from. Um, but it has become a very special place in my personal family with my husband and my children. Um, when we want to run away, that's where we go. So Waipio has become a very special place for me still. Um, but that's a little bit about me, those photos. So mahalo nui, and thank you for being here and letting me share this evening. Okay. This evening I am so honored to have been asked to speak on this very special place that I think all of us in this room love so dearly. This place called Keo Ho. In Hawaiian, if we break the word down, it really means the new current, the new era, the new age. Uh, you may have heard the new beginning. And here in Keo Ho, I experienced my own new current. 
And it was in 2009, early 2009, and my telephone rings. I was the executive assistant to the general manager here at the hotel. And my phone rings, and there's a woman on the other line, and I will refer to her as Auntie from this point forward. And Auntie says that she was told that when she comes to the hotel for an upcoming hula festival that they were going to perform at, that they needed to give a hokupu or a gift to our mene hune heo. I'm thinking, we have a mene hune heo on our property. And so as we're so well trained in our business, we say, okay, can I get your name and your number? And I'm going to find out and I'm going to call you back. And so I did that, and I got off the phone, and I immediately called Auntie Lily. Now, Auntie Lily and I had only met once or twice before this phone call. And um, so I didn't have too much interaction with her, but I immediate, when I met her for the first time before that, I immediately was drawn to her because of just of her spirit and her energy. And so I thought, okay, well, I was told, if you have any questions about the Aina, you call Auntie Lily. So I called Auntie Lily. She left a message on her answering machine and reintroduced myself, tell, told her I had a question if she could call me back. And as I've learned to know Auntie, she doesn't call back, she just shows up. <laughs> so, like two days later, um, I'm walking at the front desk and who do I see across the way? Auntie Lily. And so I'm super excited and I go up to her, I said, Auntie, and I'm really not even sure if she remembers me, right? So I go up to her, I say, hi Auntie, I'm Lily. And she said, I know. I said, did you get my message? She goes, uh-huh, I'm here, what do you need? <laughs> and I said, Okay, I said, Auntie, so I got this call from a lady, and she said she wants to give a hokupu at our mene hune heao. And she just looked at me, zero expression. She just stared at me. And I said, do we have one? And so we sat down, which is a um, different word is now, but up in, upstairs in the lobby area, and it was a really busy day, and so there's people all over, and she starts talking and just talking story about the place. And I realized at that moment that something special was going to happen. Like, I could feel it already. So I said, Auntie, let's go. Let's go walk someplace where it was nice and quiet. So we did. And we sat for three hours that day. And if you've ever had the opportunity to speak with any kupuna, you know that they don't answer your question right off the bat, straight. They will tell a story. And within the story is your answer. And if you're listening for the right reason and the message is meant for you, then you will get it. And so, hence went the three hours. And Auntie began to tell all these stories that were blowing my mind. I thought, whoa. So the whole time she's sitting and we're talking, I had already walked the property myself. I saw stuff, right, rocks and structures, but no one knew anything. No one here knew anything, and no one talked about it. And so um, this had been a year prior to this situation happening. And I always wondered why we don't talk about it and how come nobody says anything? I thought, well, maybe that's the way, because that's, that's what's supposed to be. And so literally a year to this date, I had been thinking and thinking and praying and praying and it started bugging me. Now it's gnawing at me and then it started haunting me. And I say haunting because haunting is like the only word I can think of because it started bothering me. And I was dreaming of it. Um, I couldn't sleep at night because of it and I was at work just bugging me and it started haunting me. So then, hence, this call comes in. So I did a little backtrack there. So the entire time Auntie's talking, I'm, I'm inside going, oh, I hope she takes me. Oh, I wish she would just show me the sights. I wish, I wish, I wish. And, and then this beautiful pot of dolphins come in front of us at the, in the ocean. And I thought, oh, that's one good sign. Because <laughs> in Hawaiian, we call that a ho'ailona. And so, right? And so we thought, oh, maybe I hope Auntie sees the naia. And she did. And so she stopped talking, and we both just stared at the naia. And then she continued her story. And then she looked over at me, and she said, Bebe, come. I take you. I was like, oh my gosh, is this really going to happen? So we went and we walked all of the sites. And she gave me all of the names, all of the stories, everything she had, what she was giving. And by the end of the time with her, I was crying. And we were standing underneath the shower trees near the chapel outside. And I'm crying. She starts crying. And I look at her and I say, Auntie, how come we don't talk about this stuff? Or how come everybody here acts like they don't know about anything? And she said, you know why? In one ear, out the other. She goes, I tired talk. <laughs> and right? I said, I know. I know, Auntie. She said, I said, but Auntie, I said, don't you think that people should know these stories? Because if they don't, if we don't tell them, then the stories will die. And she said, I know. And she said, but you know, hard to tell when everything you say you tell people you want to share, but then all you hear back is I, 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 I. She goes, it's always about them. She goes, it's not about the land. 
I said, I know. I said, okay. I said, but auntie, I said, can I tell the stories? This is my exact words. I said, can I tell people? And she, she just stared at me and she said, okay. I said, can I tell lots of people? Like people in the hotel first and then tell people from like all over the world, like our guests that come, can I tell everybody? And she looked at me and she said, she grabbed my hands and she stopped and she, we both, I mean, I, we're, her and I are tearing and she said, yes. She says, we can trust you. She said, you have my blessing. That's what I felt like. <laughs> and I looked at her and I thought, but at that very second, you guys, I'm not even joking, this overwhelming sense of kuliana, I felt it immediately come upon me. And I thought, holy moly, what did I just get myself into? Yeah. Seriously, right? And so I, I looked at her, I said, okay. And I said, um, so that, that day, I, f I believe that was when I really met Keo Ho. And I believe, I, I heard this from a talk that John DeFries had given a while ago, and he said that Keo Ho was where time and space meet and the flow generates this new current. And I, you know, of course, heard that way later after, but as I reflect back, I thought, wow, I just met Keo Ho, the Keo Ho, the new current. My time and this space have met, and this new current has begun. It was the most amazing day and the most changing day of my entire life. So welcome to Keo Ho. <laughs> Two years later, I, um, I journaled. I don't, I don't journal as much as I'd like to. I'm doing a better job. But I did journal this. And I would like to share with you because if any of you journal and you look back on your words, it's very cool because you see where you were at during that time. And so in my second in in meeting with Auntie, after we had this day, um, then I had to get to work. So I went back to my GM and I thought, how am I going to tell him we got to do this? I have no idea what he believes in. And so I really started believing now the energy is changing. So now the energy is, oh my gosh, that's why we're not successful. We're like totally turning our back on the kupuna, acting like they're not there. That's why we're having all these problems. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to tell my GM that. Okay, well, guess what I did? <laughs> so... It was a Monday morning and my gym and I always took time out to um, regroup after the weekend and, you know, see how things went. Anyway, thankfully he had a spiritual encounter that weekend. We never talked to spiritual things, ever. I was blown away. I, and I'd even hear half a story because the whole time in my head I'm like, oh my gosh, this is my door. This is my opening, right? So after he was done with his story, I, I started to, I said, well, I have something to share with you. And he goes, okay. So I told him I had met with Auntie the, the prior week and that this is something that was really heavy on my heart. And I said, exactly my words were, I'm taking off the executive assistant hat and I'm putting on just the Lily Hawaiian girl from Kona hat. That's who's talking to you right now. And he said, okay. I said, so this is what I think. I said, we will never be successful at this hotel unless we honor the cultural sites and tell the kupuna we know they're there. And as it fell out of my mouth, I went, oh God, he's going to think I'm so not even joking. And he looked at me and he said, I agree. I was like, you do? And he goes, I do. So what do you think we should do? And I was like, oh God. I said, can I get back to you? I said, because I have ideas. I just don't know what they are yet. Give me some time. I'm not even kidding. And he's like, okay. So my GM and I thankfully had a great relationship and he trusted me explicitly, which then started the journey of the research and continuing on the, the journey of, of learning Kaukulailai. So then I carry on and I, I'm, I'm waiting and waiting and I'm looking and I, nothing is on the internet, by the way. If you've ever punched in Kaukulailai, you won't find anything, but the one thing I found. Um, and I write this, this entry. I explained to Auntie Lily that I wanted to share this information with our management staff and our guests. One of my ideas was to make a platform sign that guests could read and just look around. On the platform, it would have the information of the different sites and information of the area. Auntie was in agreement, but explained, the most important thing for me to do was to go ask for permission. To come and spend time, sit near the ocean, and ask for permission to go forward. Explain the desire to preserve what is left and not to change anything. When I asked her what was Pono and what was not Pono to print on the signage uh, of the storyboard, Auntie said it would come. After I sit alone, Pule, ask, it will come. She tells me, be patient, don't rush. No need to move fast before you miss something. She says that I will feel it in my na'au and what is Pono to share will come. 
So my mother would have said the exact same thing. And that's where Auntie Lily immediately took me back to, was the days with my mom. And she always, Auntie Lily continued to tell me this to this day, but she said this so much in the beginning. She said, she grabs my hands, and she still does this, and she says, you be all right. You get stuck, you call me, I come. <laughs> that is Auntie's word. She still does it to me today, and that's the thing that helps me to get through what I do. So I started, re again, looking, and, and you know, that day that I had that amazing moment with Auntie Lily, I didn't have a recorder, notebook, nothing. So nothing was documented. I, I didn't remember a darn thing of all the, the words she said, right? So then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I can't tell her to come back and like tell me everything again so I can write it down. So I search and I search and I search and I thought, okay, so I go out to the, my I have a favorite spot and I sit and I sit for days, hours, I go and nothing. I'm like, oh man, this wasn't meant for me. I was mistaken, so I call and I go, auntie. So I, t I went out and I talked to the coupon and I sat and auntie, it feels really good. I said, but I don't have anything. Like, where do I begin? And she said, Lily, she said, I told you, you have to be patient. When it's time, you will find what you need. And I thought, I was thinking, oh my gosh, but I know I have my bosses going, what's, what's your big idea, Lily? Seriously, right? So I have the whole spiritual side happening, but then I have the, the business side going on at the same time. So lo and behold, as Auntie Lily said, I stayed on my track, and Ho'omanava Nui, my mom would say, just keep going, don't give up. And one day, I'm cleaning out a file cabinet, and at the bottom of our file cabinet are these uh, big, fat, red books. And um, it's covered with all kinds of stuff. And I open these red books, literally open it up, and in the very center of this book, is the entire map of the historic sites. And all of the archaeology and the research that the Cultural Surveys of Hawaii uh, company did in 2003 for the hotel when it became a Sheraton. A interviews with Auntie Lily, interviews with our former director of engineering, and everything I needed, all of the names, everything. And I was freaking out. So I run into my GM's office and I go, oh my gosh, look what I found. And he's like, that's amazing. I'm like, I know, that's what I need. So I call Auntie. And sure enough, she just, I leave a message, she comes down. <laughs> the next day, she comes on the next day, and I, sh I say, Auntie, I'm so excited. I said, look what I found. Can I use it? And I show her the book. And you know what Auntie said? She goes, oh, yeah, I have that book. <laughs> Seriously. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, so can I use it? And she said, why are you asking me? I said, because you're the kupuna. She said, Lily. She said, you got to go out, ask them. Go over there and ask them. And I thought, and there she goes, bring me right back, right? And I thought, you're right, OK. She goes, you have to trust. Go, you ask them. So I went, and I sat. And I sat, and I sat, and I sat. And like she said, the day came where I woke up. And she said, you're going to wake up one day, and you're going to know exactly what's to print what's to be said and everything. And that day came, it clear as she said, I woke up that day, I said, today was the day. And everything that I needed just fell into place as far as the project and getting the information out for the first time ever publicly. So I introduce you to Kaukulailai, um, a place that I have gr grown so fond of. And in my journey, I realized that as I'm reading of all these special places, I realized like, oh my goodness, we are in the pico of everything that changed our lives forever. Like we're sitting in the place that it all began. So as you can see, my Kaukulailai journey took me to different places. I always came back, but it took me to different places. One place that it took me was to Kuomo'o, was to Leke Leke. And Auntie Lily shared that place with me for the first time. And in my journey of learning of Leke Leke, so I'm going to give a fast little overview for those who may not be familiar with the history. Overall, it was one of the last battles of Hawaii that was fought. It was fought between Hawaiian people, and it was the Hawaiians that wanted the change that was led by Ka'ahumanu and Liho Liho at the time, King Kamehameha II. And the change was to end the kapu system the way King Kamehameha the Great had ruled. And then his, the, the ohana to the ali'i, which was led by Ke Kolani and his wife Manono, fought for the side that wanted it to stay the same, that wanted to honor Kamehameha's legacy and continue as is. So overall, that's what they fought for. Liho Liho side won. He did have an upper hand. He had a little bit more, um, I should say a little bit more. He had a decent amount of weaponry to, to win the battle. And as such, history changed forever. 
This was the Battle of Kuomo'o within a mile of Keoho. Right here, changed our history forever. Hawaii's never been the same since that battle. If you've never visited that place, please take time out to go say hello. There's a beautiful storyboard Kamehameha Schools has put up and it gives you just the right information you need. Next, I got to meet King Kamehameha III in a way that I had never met him before. And in my journey to learn about him, I realized that he became my favorite king. And um, he changed our history forever and he was born here in Keoho. And although he was born stillborn, and he lay for hours stillborn, and with the different um, rituals and prayers and um, things that they did, they, Kapihe, who was the kahu or the kahuna at the time, was able to bring him back to life. But you know what? The gods had a hand in that because they say that Kawikioli had a destiny, that he had a prophecy to fulfill. And I believe that he did the best he could with the time that he had to rule. He was 10 years old when his brother became king, um, or his brother died and he became king, so Kahumanu as well as other members of his ohana helped him to rule. When he was in about his 20s, he was able to actually be king and hence his journey as king began. But technically, he was king for 30 years, longest any Kamehameha had ever ruled. Just that alone tells you he had an opportunity to make a big difference. He brought public education to all of Hawaii, from no schools to over 400 schools statewide, teaching all children of Hawaii how to read and how to write. I think that the, the blessing that Kawikioli gave upon the people was that he saw the world changing. And he knew that if they were gonna be successful in this new world that was coming in fast, that they needed to know some of the things that he knew as, as a li'i they were taught. So he started public schools. He also started, um, he was the reason why the Hawaiian people became literate. Um, the written language came into place during that time, which was a very important time in our history because prior to that, because nothing was documented in writing, we can only go back so far and get the paper, yeah? After a while, then it's accounts and cross-referencing. So this was a very important time for our history so that now our history could be documented in writing. He created the first constitution Hawaii had ever seen, which was a big deal because constitutional government was not the way people had been governed, right? The king had the final say, nobody had a say. Now people had a say, commoners had a say, foreigners had a say. They could do this thing called voting. Pfft, that changed our history forever. So the first constitution, Kawikioli introduced. Um, he also created the Great Mahele, which ended up allowing land ownership to be possible. And that changed Hawaii's history forever. And then he, of course, last but not least, created the model that we use as our state model today that um, I feel we should remember our state model more often today. Um, but Kawikioli really changed our history forever, and he was born right on the road. If you've never been there, I strongly encourage you uh, to participate in Monday's um, celebration with the Daughters of Hawaii. Uh, they will be down there to honor Kawikioli's birth, and um, please, if you've not been down there, take some time out to just go give your aloha to Kawikioli's birth site and know that we, we live in such a very special place. In my learning of Kawikioli, I learned of his mother, Keopuo Lani, and she was a queen that we don't often get to learn about, and that is my second favorite ali'i. And Keopuo Lani, she was had it, I think she had like a silent power, and her, she was regarded as one of the most sacred when she was alive. So sacred that when she lived here in Keoho Bay, when she was having Kawikioli while she lived here, she made the entire village sacred. If your shadow had fell upon the village, the consequences could be quite severe, so people would avoid the village. And to avoid the village, they would swim from Haikawa Point, which is the other side of Keoho Bay, to Kaukulailai, our point, in the morning hours when the shadows were falling seaward. And in the afternoon hours when the shadows shifted up Mauka, they would hike behind Ahuula Cliff, which is still here today. And so they did that to respect Keopuoleni. What I found interesting is if you try to find pictures of her, I couldn't find any, you know, there was a time where they were drawing the ali'i and there's nothing of Keopuoleni. If anybody found one, will you be so kind to share it with me? Don't have to give me a copy. I would just love to see it. Um, I researched at Bishop Museum. I spent two and a half days in the archives, many, many hours up here at Kona Historical Society, going through everything. And, and one of that was learning about Keopuoleni. And I really believe, because she was so sacred, like nobody could even get close enough to draw her. Think about it, unless she invited them, right? There is a memoir of her that you can read, um, but Keopuoleni lived right here in Keoho. And I got this document um, 
Henry Kekahuna, who is quite famous for the mapping that, or the maps that he drew, um, came here, and I'm gonna share some of that in a little bit. But in his notes, which I'm very privileged to have a copy of the Keoho piece, uh, he writes this. A mile south from Kahalu'u and five from Kailua lies the village of Keoho, once supremely sacred and a proudest of the royal lands on the big island of Hawaii. So exceedingly taboo indeed was Keoho that if even so much as the shadow of a commoner, and it gets a little funny, but it looks like it says fell on or near at hand, it would be put to death for this heinous sacrilege. Therefore, in the morning, when shadows fell seaward, travelers had preferred to swim across the bay from its point of Haikawa on the north to, the, to that of Kaukulailai on the opposite shore, or vice versa. In the afternoon, however, when shadows fell inland, passersby kept a respectful distance behind the pali of Ahuula, which means feather cape or cloak, that enfolded from the rear the low portion of the village between it and the curve of its splendid white sand beach of former days. Speaking of Keoho Bay. So that was from Kekahuna, who was here in the early 50s. And when I read that story, I thought, how special is that? So I tell people, not only is this a special place, but it was considered one of the most sacred places at one time. Through my journey, I believed that there was a time, the time had come for Kaukulailai to have its place in history and in a way that would be not forgotten. And so I could, on my journey, I document the ho'ilina o kaukulailai, the legacy of kaukulailai. And not the legacy before us, but the legacy of now. Because I believe that, you know, we say, oh, I wonder what my legacy will be or what their legacy is. Well, you know what? We are the legacy now. And it, soon, we will be the ancestors and the predecessors and the legacy. And so what is that legacy going to be? And I am determined to make sure that the legacy is upright and strong and alive for Kaukulailai because it's re really never been. So I introduce you to the legacy of Kaukulailai this evening. In my time reading and researching, there is lots of statements that have come my way that keep me on track. And this one, Heli Aina Hekawa Kekanaka, the land is the chief and man is its servant that this continues to keep me on track to know that I am not in charge of this place. I am here for a time to do my work and then I will move on, but that the land will guide me every step of the way. And Tilili continues to remind me, this is what she told me that day under the trees. She said, everything you need to have culture alive at this property, Lily, is right around you. You don't need anything else. She said, stop, listen, see, and feel. She said, the answers are here. And every time I got doubts, I went back to that. And I thought, okay. So I just went back outside and I just sat to get the answers. When I started the storyboard and the documenting, I started with this saying, Iulu no kalala ikikumu, the branches grow because of the trunk. Without our ancestors, we would not be here. My first kupuna I speak of is Auntie Lily. You know, in my, in my getting close to her, she has spent majority of her life standing up for Keo Ho. And I, and I thought, you know, so many times I've sat and just listened to her and cried. And I thought, okay, you know, we all have kuleana. This isn't just mine. We all have kuleana here in Keo Ho. And so Kaukulailai has become a very special place. And I will start to kind of tell you some of these places. Some of you have may have been on the tour with me. Mahalo Nui for coming. You're welcome to come again. Um, some of you may not have been on the tour. You are welcome to come and enjoy. Just come to the hotel. Um, Kaukulailai, when I asked Auntie what she meant, what she believed that this name meant, she said Ko means the place and Lai was, uh, is forehead. And so like the forehead is the highest point of our body, Auntie Lily believes that it got this name because it could have been the highest point of Keoho Bay at one time. This is Auntie Lily's manao. She said it could have been as tall as the building. She just remembers that from her stories that they were told was very, very large. The boulders that are still underneath the point that we call Pa'akai Point today, or the deck, are so huge, longer than the human body, bigger than the human body. And Tilili says, maybe the Menehune built the heiau to protect the village from the surf. We see every winter, yeah? So Kaukulailai, though, in so many ways, the name makes sense. That heiau, 
overall are these structures that are built for spiritual reasons and all heia were built for a specific reason. So in relation to um, agriculture, to healing, um, to fishing, um, all of the elements around the area would be taken into place, the wind, the sun, where the sun sets, where the sun rises, where the moon is, the stars, the season, everything will be taken into account when the heia was being built. And there's so much of that. And the reason why I bring that up is because although Kaukulailai is not in physical form today, the elements are still here. They still remind us that the land is still alive. And Kaukulailai, I believe, is sprinkled amongst us, actually. So if you look here in the pictures, I have that, that yellow arrow pointing where I'm speaking of. That's Kaukulailai Point on the old maps. And then that's the name of the Heia or where it used to stand. Beneath here, this is a picture I just took the other day. These rocks are the last remaining parts of Kaukulailai. And so we um, have agreed and committed to not building anything, of course, anything further, because most of you know there's a concrete slab, actually, was from a former home that was there prior to the hotel being built. And um, we've left this area alone. We keep it clean, and a sign will be actually out by next week. We're going to have a sign for Keo Kaukulailai so people can respect the area. Around this area, along the shoreline, all of the rocks in this area, um, I asked Auntie, you think that's from the Heiau? She goes, oh yeah. So I tell our visitors especially, I say, so you never know where you are. I said, look around you, these stone walls, this foundation, all the rocks sprinkled on the ocean, probably all parts of the Heiau. Please don't take the rocks, leave everything here, because you just don't know where you are. Just don't know where you are. So to respect the, respect the Aina. John Reinecke was here in the 1930s. I would refer to him on every site because he mapped this area out. He was an employee of Bishop Museum at the time, and when he visited Kaukulailai, he wrote this. The whole platform of the Heiau is so rough and dilapidated that it is hard to trace its original form and limits carefully. Apparently, it was oriented east and west with dimensions overall about 110 by 40 feet. There apparently have been later additions. So with that and Auntie Lily's stories, we know that it was a very large structure um, but Kaukulailai. This is the map that I'm speaking of um, from John Reinecke. This I know you can't read it, but I just kind of wanted to give you a glimpse of what it looks like. Um, I got this from the Bishop Museum and the archives, and um, the very top, these are the historic sites that are on the, nor are on the coastline of our hotel, and then the bottom drawing where you say I have here above inset is located, so that arrow is that up there, that inset, so you can see how many structures were in this area at one time. Lots. Yeah. This is the map of Henry Kekahuna. This is available publicly. Um, if you want to look at it, you just go on Google or you know type up Keoho map or Henry Kekahuna maps and you'll get it. Um, this has also been a driving force in my research uh, because he had some very good notes here on, on the map. But he, this is the only area that I saw Kaukulailai actually documented in this map and in that story that I shared with you earlier, which was his note from his notebook. So Kaukulailai Point. You can see how they spell it differently. Um, the language has gone through many um, changes through the years. So, and the way in which, as I even read back on that, the way in which that they would break up the words to help change the, the way you said things. So that's the way Henry Kekahuna um, wrote it. The rest of Kaukulailai, um, I consider our gifts or makana from our kupuna. I believe that these gifts um, were given to us to understand what our kuleana is today. And so this first gift is our pohakupele. I literally just translated that over to bell stone. Bell stones are very common throughout Hawaii. And when I first met this stone, it was sitting under our thornless kiave tree. I don't have time to talk about that story, but if you want to know about it, come talk to me after. Um, but it was sitting under this kiave tree, propped up on some other stones. It looked like a beautiful rock bench. That's the proper way to hold the bell stone. Uh, we put it here with Auntie Lily's um, guidance because people tended to sit on it and get near to it. And so we th and Auntie was with me the day actually that was happening. And she said, you know, let's move the stone. Let's get it upright so people know that it's a special stone. A bell stone says that if you hit it in a specific spot with a type of baton, that you would be able to sound it like a bell. I have not played it. I don't know anyone who knows how to play it. I think someone will figure it out one day. And when they do, we will take the stone out of the ground, put it back, and get it ready. Our engineering team actually helped us so that we could properly display it. Um, 
the the bells they probably won't be so happy when I ask them to put it back flat. It was quite a task. <laughs> it's a very large stone. The other part of the stone, if you can kind of see in the in the picture, you see what looks like holes. I read that they would get another um, sharp stone and dig into the pohaku and make those stones and stick their fingers and pray. Maybe it was a prayer stone at one time. I don't know, but that's enough information for me to say, okay, you get your space, yeah? You get your story, you get your place. I don't have to confirm it more than that after hearing the stories. We just let them have its time. And last but not least, if you look at the very top of the stone, you'll see a, a hole, you'll see some white around the hole. And on my tour, which I think these are little gifts that I get from the kupuna, on my tour was a gentleman who had done research on this and he said, you know, Lily, you know what else I learned? He said, they used to take the pico, the umbilical cord, which in our culture is very sacred, and some families will plant it, put a tree, or bury it, put a tree on top of it. Some take it to the ocean and bury it. Um, some take it into the bellstone, he said, and put it in the puka and cover it with what looks like cement. So on the other side, that one looks like something could have been there at one time. On the other side of the stone is one. There is a hole that's covered with what looks like cement. So I, even more so, like, okay, this stone gets its special place. So. A sign is also going with that stone very soon, so people will know the special stone that it is. The next makan or the gift that the kupuna have left for us is this um, nohona a pa pipi. Uh, so two things. When I first was introduced to this site, Auntie Lily referred to it as a um, cookhouse, or in Hawaiian we might call it a halekuke. Based on the size and the shape and what was inside, she believes that this is a cookhouse based on the rest of the village. In the research done by the archaeologists, and when they went and they tested the soil and things, they identified it as a cattle pen. In Auntie Lily's interviews, um, she continues to repeat herself that there was no cattle pen over here. She said, no, nope, too hard to get the cattle up there. They took them up there, closer to the bay. She's prob totally probably right. Um, so I believe that at one time, maybe the use changed. When the village was being lived in cookhouse, so I quote them both, and then later on turned cattle pen because we see the ranchers would use what they have on the land. It is not uncommon to see that happen. And with the things that they found in there, at some point in time, the peepee -pee were there. Yeah, maybe it was a personal pen for a cowboy locally here. And there's also a panini or prickly pear cactus that is, um, that is there in the cattle pen that has remained because it's a part of the story. So a, a, a cowboy told me one day, Lily, the cows like to eat the leaves of the cactus plant, so the cows probably brought it here. I went, oh, you're probably right. Darn it, I can't get rid of it now. <laughs> so it's not very pretty. I might just trim it back, but that's our, that's our cattle pen. And the one thing to remember, you know, I, like this is a prime example of that, you know, we can only go as far back as we can. We can only rely upon the stories that have been passed on. And so, number one, this, there's no one that's right or wrong. Um, I believe that everybody deserves their story to be told, so I tell them all. And this, what, this is what happens, yeah? Times change, so we have to keep the stories going so we can keep the legacy. Our next makana that our kupuna have left for us are these ku'ula. Ku'ula are, uh, in English, a fish god stone. And I love these stones because this immediately tells us what their life was like, tells us what they believed in, tells us what their traditions were, tells us what their lifestyle was surrounded, right? Why would they have fish god stones if fishing wasn't a part of their daily life? This tells us what their daily life consists of. So Kuula could be small, where the fisherman could hold it in his pocket or on him. He could have carved it and, and keep it with him. Or it could be big like this, where it would stay on the land. And depending on the fisherman tradition, again, whatever your ohana believed in, you would either give offering after you pile fish. This basically would be the mahalo for the fish that you'd gathered from the bay. Um, some stones were representative of certain fish, possibly, in some of the research I did. Um, maybe some would hanai or feed the ku'ula on a regular basis to keep the mana or the energy flowing. It really depends on your tradition. But the ku'ula represent that connection to the elements. I feel the kupuna have and the lesson for us is to, to remember that connection to the element that always take time out to say thank you. I wasn't raised using ku'ula. I was uh, born in the 70s and so the current of that time was that we didn't know about ku'ula. We didn't talk about ku'ula. My kupuna didn't talk about ku'ula, but they taught me how to fish. And they, my mother taught us how to 
pick the haukeuke, the opihi, the pipipi, the kupee, the limu, all from the coastline. And we had rules. There was always protocol. And um, it's funny because it wasn't ceremonial at all, but there was like as if the ocean had a personality. I was raised that way. Like there was a, it's a personality. We didn't do any rituals or religious anything. It just, that's the way I was raised. And so m there was this, always this very deep respect for the water. And I believe that that trickled down from the ku'ula. Even though I wasn't raised using ku'ula or you don't see that in our culture, the respect for the ocean and always taking time out to say thank you, still a part of our culture. And any of you who gather from the ocean, you know what I'm talking about. There's always this very deep mahalo at the end to say mahalo for all that you had gathered. Only take what you need, right? Um, but respecting the ocean. For the f we take care of the ocean, the ocean will continue to take care of us. The next makana that our kupuna gave us is the halau va'a, or the canoe shed. The drawing on the left is the drawing that was in the book that I found uh, done by the cultural research, uh, courtesy of the cultural service of Hawaii Company. Um, John Reineke also cited this this site when in his study, as well as another group of archaeologists by the name of Alan Walker and Alan Hahn. And if you do any research, you'll see their names pop up quite frequently. And in 1989, they were here and they recorded this. They say, the age of this feature is estimated between AD 1562 to 1736 on the basis of hydration rind dating. Later comments say it is believed to be a pre-contact canoe shed based on structural form, orientation, and location adjacent to the bay. So we see here that it, this is a very old structure. We have not touched a stone in this location. This has withstood some very long years. And I was very pleased to know that um, when I read that and how old that this structure had been that it was still with us today. The entrance and the exit to the ocean is in line with the entrance. This is the entrance of the canoe shed. That's what it looks like today. And right in direct line to the ocean would have been the entrance and exit for the canoe. And we, um, today when you look, you're thinking, that was a rough in and out over the rocks. But I have a friend here that works in our engineering department. And he was raised on the bay. He, his grandfather owned a house in the front of the bay. So he was fishing out here all the time as a little kid. And so when I was taking the engineering team on this tour, he and I got to the halalva'a, and I showed this would have been the entrance and exit based on what I've seen at other halalva'a. Very simple. No, no need to take it to a pier like we have to do today. Um, he looked at me, and he said, Lily, oh my goodness, he said, he kind of looked at the canoe shed, looked over at the water. He said, there used to be a rock pathway that went out to the ocean over here. I was thinking, what? He goes, yeah. He said, but as little kids, his grandfather, before they left the house, he said, hey, no be kolohe. Don't touch the stones, don't mess around, leave everything alone. He said, we got scolded every time before we left the house. <laughs> so he said, so we kind of all like walked by the, the rock path and just looked at it. And he said, it was just weird. We never knew what it was for. I said, that was for the canoe shed. He goes, that was for the canoe. And we kind of looked at each other like, this is so amazing. So that day, you know, I consider that a gift from the kupuna for both of us, for he and I, growing up here in Kiyoho Bay and not even knowing the canoe shed was there his whole life. He said, I never knew this was here. This was covered by trees. And he said, my, my papa didn't talk about it. I said, it's OK. It's not a bad thing. That's just the way it was. But now you know. Yeah, now you know. So our halau va'a. Our next gift um, from our kupuna uh, is this salt pan in Hawaiian. One of the words is a lot of different words, but I chose to use this one, kaheka. And basically, the seawater would gather there that you see in the pan. You can actually see the lines of where the water would dry. So the water evaporates, and then just the sea salt is left, and you would come and scrape it up. Um, in Hawaiian, we call it uh, pa'akai. And I love that word because, number one, it literally translates. If you think about it, pa'a is to be firm or stronghold, and then kai is seawater, so you see how the words come into play there. Um, in our culture today, pa'akai symbolizes cleansing and healing. It is normal for us to either go to the ocean in Hawaii, and like for the halau that I grew up in, we would do hiuvai. So we would go to the ocean to cleanse before a big event after training for months and months and months. And that was just to take a moment to let go of whatever we had that didn't have anything to do with our performance and make sure we were pono and ready to go. So salt, very, very significant in our culture still today. Um, you'll see salt or pa'akai used in blessings. People will use that either the water or actual the actual salt to bless. Um, so 
I love the salt pan because it also reminds me of, um, you know, when we find salt pans, we know people lived here. It was a normal part of their life to have salt pans. We have a total of three on property. This is the only one that's easy to see. The other one has been concreted to the uh, stone wall at the caretaker's cottage that we have here on the property. And the third one will be displayed soon. I'm very excited. We had some sneaky guys in our hotel that hid it when the hotel went under um, years ago when it closed down. They hid the stone. And last year, they took me to this room and said, we have something to show you. <laughs> I was like, what? And they unveiled the, the salt pan. So we're, we're excited. It's got a spot now. We just cleaned the area. We have a place for it. So you can come visit it. Um, all right. The next... Our next makana, um, again, really confirming that our kupuna were here. This is amazing. These are three house platforms. I know it looks like two, but on this side, these are two. Um, let me show you here. One and then two. They, in, the, in the drawing, they don't, dif they don't show that. But this is um, two house platforms attached to the back of the canoe shed. So there are two hale in the back of the canoe shed. I was out there with some keiki uh, and on one tour, and they said, auntie, this was like the, the canoe shed was like the garage. I said, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so simple. Um, and then the other, that's the other um, house platform. We actually, this one is very easy to see today. And we actually, it's, it's become a part of the site, the uses of the hotel. It's become a popular wedding location. And um, of course, no one knew when it became that, what it really was. Is it my wish to return it to a site only? Absolutely. Is it something that is super important that will change everything overnight? Yeah, if I like put that one on the list. So I believe that when we do make those changes, everybody got to be on the same page and everybody got to be pono. So I've left this until we can get to a time where we can actually we do that. For now, thankfully, it's not a heyo. Thankfully, it's a house platform. Um, but I will be honest, our sales and catering team, when I first told them, they kind of went, now what? I'm like, I know, I know, I know. Let's just don't, just wait. One thing at a time, we'll be okay. <laughs> I said one thing. I went and I said, Kalamai already, please. Um, and that is my personal drawing of a hale. I am not an artist. My son is the artist in my family. But you know what? I told my husband, look, the kupuna were with me when I drew that. <laughs> and the reason why I have that up here is because I have it actually on the sign that's coming up so our visitors can get an idea of what it really looked like on the structure, yeah, to make it personal and a connection. Now this real picture, current picture here at the corner, this is actually the picture of this. That rectangle is that rectangle there. This is remnant of a wooden deck that was built here when the hotel was originally built back in the 70s. And as much as we would love to remove it, maybe one day we can, but for now the commitment has been not to build anything further. In my, this was actually my first decision when I was the I wasn't even in this position, I was executive assistant and our GM at the time said, Lily, can you go outside and look because there's rocks over there and we want to put something here because it looks ugly. And I thought, okay. So I went out there, I, I didn't know what I knew yet. And I went out there and I looked around and I went, man, there's got to be something. And so I went back to my boss, I said, there's something totally there. I said, it is my recommendation that we don't do anything, just leave it alone until we figure out you know, what's there. And look. They listen. So, and we continue to leave it alone. Even Auntie, I called Auntie and I said, Auntie, what do you suggest? She said, you know, unless you have the right resources, the right people, the right everything to remove, she said, it's very, very hard. So she said, so for now, leave it alone. Don't build anything more. I said, okay. And this is the very special heyo kani kani kaula. Remember the many hune heyo that the Auntie called me about? I think this is the one she was talking about. <laughs> So I attribute Kani Kani Kaula to be the beginning of my journey. Um, when Auntie introduced me to Heo Kani Kani Kaula, she shared the story about her father using this Heo. So we know that it was used at a fishing shrine at some time with her ohana. The story says that they would, after fishing, she would come down and bring food for the men. And she said every time it was time to give offerings, she was told to go home. And so she said, I only remember men being present to give offering. Her notes also say that her father would, um, whenever they came back from fishing, they would kalua a pig. And then after they were done, before they ate, they would wrap some kalua, they would wrap some fish that they had caught, and they would take it down to Kani Kani Kaula and give offering. So we're very thankful that we have that mo'olelo because heyo, again, are only designed for specific things, and we don't want to misrepresent it. So 
we call it uh, the fishing shrine thanks to Auntie Lily. In front of the heiau is another ku'ula where offerings were placed on the opposite end on the, on the coastline side and that ku'ula is still there today. When John Reineke um, saw this site in 1930, he wrote this. Platform on knoll, about 43 by 30 by 4. The site pointed out by a fisherman as a fishing heiau. The fisherman that he spoke with called it Pohaku Kanikaula, or Moku Kanikaula, which is also the name of the rock offshore. It signifies red sounding or echoing rock. When the two gentlemen, Walker and Han, in 1989, when they came, they said that they had found marine shell midden bone, which is consisted of fish, mammal, and bird, coral, water-worn pebbles, charcoal flecks. A carbon date extending into the modern period was recovered from this feature. Pre-contact habitation, food processing, and fishing-related activities are indicated. So that's what the archaeologists say. So again, in line with what Auntie Lily said. Yeah? What's really interesting is I knew the stories of Auntie Lily first, which was really cool as I was researching and get, got this information. Some of the fish that were famous here in Keoho that they attribute maybe from Kani Kani Kaula, um, the Akule, the Uhu, the Aveoveo, Upapalu, Veke, Nenue, and Menpachi. A lot of nighttime fishing fish, but that's some of the kupunas say that were very famous here in Keoho. Now, Kani Kani Kaula has become significant to us at the hotel because one of the stories that we think about are the Akule. Akule became a very big part of anti-storytelling because Keoho Bay was famous for the big Akule schools. And she says they, still, they do still come. Some of you might see them. They just don't come as much as when she was a little girl. But when they come now, they are significant. And twice in the very early days when I was with Auntie, spending a lot of time out there with her, we got big schools of Akule. So I was able to see them with her in these huge circles. And they just move along the, the, the water. And she told me, this is, they're going to go this way, then they're going to go that way, then they're going to go this way, and then they're going to go there. They did exactly that. I was just, I love that. See, they're so in touch with the, with the aina, with the element still. Now, the, the kani kani kula could be attributed to helping to bring in the akule, yeah, keep the fishing uh, prosperous in Kyoho. And so Sig Zane was brought in when the hotel recently went under renovation. He was brought in um, to help us uh, bring some of his beautiful artwork alive in the hotel, but also to tell the story, to bring in some of the cultural components of the land into the design and fabric work of the hotel. And so I was very excited to be able to work with him. And um, as he learned of the hotel and of the property, and then all of the stories that he already had from Kupuna that they were connected to and Auntie Nalani were connected to, they were able to bring together this design that, of the dress that I'm wearing. This is our uniform um, design. And he pulled in all of these components of the land, one of them being the Akule. He put the school of Okule in our uniform to remind us that just like the Okule come to Keoho Bay for rest and nourishment, right? If we take care of the ocean, the ocean is clean, they will come. But then when they're pao, they go. But as long as we take care, they will come back again for more. And they're still feeding the people of Keoho. And so he reminds us here at the hotel, same thing. If we take care of the land and take care of the foundation of, for the kupuna, he said, everything we need will come. The people that we need to come for rest and nourishment to give us what we need, which is the paycheck every two weeks so that I can go to the store and buy my food and put gas in my car, right? It's so simple. If we take care of the aina, everything we need will come. So. We're really honored to have that, and he put that in the fabric of our uniform to remind us, but this comes from Kani Kani Kaula. Last year, I was in a conference, and John DeFries was the, was the speaker, and he said some really profound things that were, were profound to me, and so I took a lot of notes, and thankfully, because I'm able to quote him today, and I do have his permission, I have asked him if I could use his, um, his information, and not only did he say yes, he gave me the CD that his PowerPoint came from. So I was like, yay! So I'm excited to tell him that I made it through the lecture. Um, but you know, he shared some very special comments, and this one that I have on the top, that our success is in our past that ancient wisdom is timeless, that it is always relevant. It is current and future-based. He told us that day that we must believe in what we do to bring change. With change, though, comes great kuleana. I felt that that day with Auntie Lily. This what I thought was really profound. He said, until you are able to put value on those things that are intangible, you will just be repeating what you've always been doing. And I think in our culture, 
we live in the intangible in the Hawaiian culture. We really do. So many of the decisions that I have made have been based on the na'o. And thankfully, I have been blessed with some really amazing bosses that totally accept me for who I am. And if I make a decision, they say, Lily, why do you think? And I go, just because. That's what I feel. They go, OK. And you can ask, uh, some of the managers are here tonight. You can ask them. And it's like, I, just, I don't know how to tell you, but that's just what I feel. It's like, OK, well, that's it then. I'm very thankful. And this really rang through to me because of the position I have here at the hotel and because of the, the entity that I'm connected to. And it says, we are in a position of influence, is what he said. The second part is my comment. Well, then what are we influencing? And that's what I, that's what I use here in my work because we influence thousands of people every year to come stay with us, right? We spend hundreds upon thousands of dollars in our company to convince people to come stay here at the hotel. Well, now when they come, what are we telling them? I said, we have such a huge influence on the entire economy of Hawaii that sometimes we forget. So I go back to that. When we print an ad, when we print a magazine, when we print an article, when I'm asked to speak in an article, I'm very mindful because People are influenced by what we do and what we say, especially as a hotel. So be very mindful of what we're doing. Auntie Lily's famous saying, famous, and if you've been in any of her thing, any of her moments where she's speaking, she'll say this. Use your think tank. That's why God gave it to us. You have problems, she said, sit down, think about it. Use your brain. You're smart. So I've shared with you this evening what started out as a side project five years ago. And literally a side project. My boss said I could do the research, I could build the storyboard, I could make a brochure, as long as I tended to my normal duties that I was here for. And I said, okay. So I did. And here came a storyboard, then a brochure, so you could do a self-guided tour on your own. You could pick it up at the front desk. Then I was asked to do tours here and there, special tours, VIP, sales VIPs, special groups, okay, once in a blue moon. Then I was asked to do a tour once a week, still executive assistant. I was like, yes, this is amazing. So then we actually had a scheduled tour once a week. Then my GM said, gosh, Lily, this is really amazing. We should do it two times a week. I said, okay. So we did it two times a week, but I was still the executive assistant to the GM, so I really did it you know, kind of on the side. And now I stand here before you, five years later, as an executive committee member of the leadership team of this hotel, being asked to culturally guide the property, starting with our leadership team to make sure that everything that we do is pono. Pono by the kupuna, pono by the land. And you know, the land is, the, when I say kupuna, I also am speaking of the land and the kupuna that are not here anymore. And pono for the kupuna that are here. And that is a big deal to me. I am tasked with making sure that all of the employees of the hotel are properly educated with the historic information of the land. So it's a part of our new hire orientation now that everybody starts working here, goes through a cultural program with me. What started out with a 45 minute slot in our new hire orientation to do the tour, now I have four hours in an eight hour day. Half of it is on culture. And we do this every month. And in every meeting, in every, everything that we do, we always make sure that we start with aloha as our foundation. And that is something that I was raised with by my kumuhula, who I'm, I think is here this evening, that if it wasn't for some of those foundational pieces that she gave me, I wouldn't have been able to handle what Auntie Lily told me those many years ago. And today I share with you the beginning of Ho'olina o Kaukulailai, the mission and its kuleana. I want to read to you something that I wrote 
when I finally was able to put some organization to my thoughts. This is the mission of, of the legacy. E ho'ona'awao, to educate. From the heart of Kawikioli, King Kamehameha III, he says, He aupuni ho'ona'awao, my kingdom will be a kingdom of learning. My king, uh, King Kamehameha III had a mission to educate the people of Hawaii in the new era of religion and language while he was king focusing on Christianity and the English language. It was his honest intention to support his people in the new way of life that was being formed around him. Today we have come full circle because we are teaching the ways of old, sharing the stories of the kupuna that have been forgotten. The Hawaiian values of living, the Hawaiian language, the history of the land, the connection to the land so that it will never be lost. Instead, intertwined into our lives today, helping us to be pon on all that we do and have true aloha for everything from the past, the present, and the future. Remembering the future as we build a legacy of kaukulailai. Our kuleana, to honor the land and the kupuna by sharing and acknowledging the history and mo'olelo of Keoho Bay and kaukulailai. To create the legacy by reaching to the past for guidance and the ancient wisdom. And to create this new legacy for Keoho to connect people to this land in a way that will develop a deeper understanding of the culture and Hawaii, to provide an authentic experience that will give self-renewal, appreciation, humility, and respect, a personal understanding and connection to who they are and their contributions to the world, meaning those who come, who they are, finding themselves here at Kaukulailai, to be the location for cultural sharing, for learning, for connecting, we will accomplish this by providing the opportunities for all. And I go on to list some more details. But that is my plan for Kaukulailai, and that is the future legacy. And I, and I always go back to this, because it, it is the kupuna, it is not me. Iulu no kalalai kikumu, the branches grow because of the trunk. Without our ancestors, we would not be here. And those historic sites that I shared with you this evening, they are the messages today. I believe that every time that I learn more and more about them, I realize that they're not just historic sites, that they're here to tell us a message so that we can pass it on. The message is not the same though today than it was 50 years ago or another 50 years before that. The message has changed because we have changed, because the place has changed and we have to adapt to that change. And so my kuleana, and, and I think actually I should say our kuleana, and especially those who do this work, that to get those messages and in, translate them in the modern way today, not losing the ancient wisdom, so that it can carry on to the future, to these future generations that we all speak of. We have to keep it, give it to the future generations. We have to give it to the future generations. Okay, well make sure you know what you're giving. What are you giving? Is it going to last 100 years or is it gonna last one year? So as we give and as we plan, make sure that it lasts for the future of Hawaii and the future of the place that you're at. And that's when I read at John DeFries, he says to remember the future when we're doing these things. So Keo Ho, where my time in this space have met and the current has renewed itself. I am so honored and humbled to be here at, at Kaukulailai and Keo Ho. I think I found, I don't think, I know I found my Keo Ho. Or maybe it found me. Mahalo Nui.